السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him upon all conditions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household, all his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless every single one of them And may he bless every one of us as well Ameen My brothers and sisters, I'm sure when we visit people in their homes for a meal, we know when to go and we know how long to sit for. And when people visit us, we would expect them to know when to come and we would expect them to know how long to sit for. If you've invited someone for supper, for example, you would not be expecting them at lunchtime. You would expect them close to the supper time. And once the supper is over, perhaps, you would not want them to sit up to midnight. You would actually prefer it if they understood when to leave. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us blessings. It might sound something very simple, but did you know that this issue is addressed in the Quran? This issue is addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because sometimes we make ourselves comfortable in people's homes and we don't realize that it is irritating them because we are sitting too long. I think a lot of the women folk would agree they don't mind feeding 50 people for as long as the people disperse once they are finished the meal and they don't waste time sitting up to midnight for, for example, the women folk to have to sit and to wait in order to clear up and all the people were doing was just sitting and chatting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So there is a narration muttafaqun alayh of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. He says when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got married to Zainab bin Tijahsh radiallahu anha, he invited some people for a meal. And so quite a few people came from among the companions. And they sat. Some of them came a bit early. And they happened to sit. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sat with them. And after some time, the meal was served. And after the meal, they sat. And they continued sitting. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was feeling hurt within himself that these people do not know when exactly to go. But just like you and I, we would be shy to tell our guest, please can you leave now? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So the Prophet ﷺ was shy. He didn't tell them anything. But he made like he wanted to get up. They did not understand the sign. They didn't understand the sign. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So a little while later, he got up. And so they got up with him. But three of them remained seated. And so the others left. And these three sat for a long, long time. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, after a while, they got up and they went away. And later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses clarifying that nobody should do this. Yes, these verses are connected straight to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But the lesson is for us all. We need to know, we need to understand the timings. We need to know when to go to someone's place, why we are going there and how long to sit for. And also, I want to add one more thing, what to say when you are there. We should not engage in backbiting, in gossip, in slander, but rather we should say things that are beautiful. If you sit at someone's place for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, the moment you have sat for more than 15 minutes just on a social, perhaps you will start speaking about other people. You know, it takes you 15 minutes to say, how are you? How's your children? What's happening? How was the day? What's going on? Exactly 15 minutes later, you start saying, you know that woman there? That's when you need to get up and walk away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. May He protect us from gossip. May He make us from those who can protect our tongues. I mean, Allah says, verse number 53 of Surah Al-Ahzab, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tadkhulu buyuta nabi illa illa an yu'dhana lakum ila ta'amin ghayra nadhirina ina walakin idha du'itum fadkhulu faidha ta'imtum fantashiru wala mustanisina li hadith O oh, you who believe, do not enter the homes of the Prophet wasallam unless you're invited for a meal. And do not go so early waiting for it, but rather go at the time of the meal. You will eat and you will disperse without engaging in extra discussion. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says thereafter, 
إن ذلكم كان يؤذي النبي فيستحيي منكم والله لا يستحيي من الحق Indeed, that was harming the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he was shy. He was shy of you to tell you that, you know what, it's hurting me. You, you better get up and go away. I've got other things to do perhaps. So Allah says, but Allah is not shy of the truth. And this is why Allah revealed such clear cut verses in Surah Al-Ahzab. Who would believe that this matter is addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran? I invite you, my brothers and sisters, to give a little bit more importance to the timing of visiting others when and how much and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to earn Jannah through His obedience and through learning lessons from these beautiful reasons of revelation of the verses of the Holy Quran. Then we have verse number 59 of the same surah where Ibn Sa'd makes mention of a narration of Abi Malik in his book at Tabaqat. And he says, the women of the believers sometimes used to leave their homes for necessity in the evenings. And some of the hypocrites used to sit on the sides in order to harass the women. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses telling the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to inform his wives, his daughters and the believing women to dress in a specific way when they leave their homes. Let's listen to the instruction. Verse number 59, Surah Al-Ahzab. يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهن من جلابي بهن ذلك أدنى أن يعرفن فلا يؤذين الله says O messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم Tell your wives, tell your daughters, and tell the believing women to draw the outer garments upon themselves when they are going out of the homes in order that they may be recognized as believing women and not harassed. Subhanallah. What a beautiful verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an instruction. It's important for us to ensure that we learn two things. One is to be able to be dressed appropriately when we leave our homes. And this injunction is more for the women folk, but obviously the men also, it's about time we, inst- we encouraged one another to dress appropriately. It does not mean that because the rules of hijab have made mention of women folk, that the men don't have a dress code in Islam. Sometimes our clothing is also too tight. Sometimes it is see-through. Sometimes buttons all down. We're showing our stomachs, our bellies, our chests and everything else, claiming that I'm only supposed to be covering from the navel to the... Ni, may Allah forgive us. That's not the ruling. The ruling is that is the bare minimum, but you are supposed to be modestly dressed as well. Correctly dressed, something loose, something good fitting, meaning something that's not tight and so on. The material not too thin. That injunction is for the males as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. And I think I need to draw our attention once again to the genes of today that happen to show half of our backsides when we go into sajda for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah forgive us. Wallahi, the worst thing that can happen in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when a man enters and he says, Allahu Akbar for the sake of Allah. And he opens his eyes and he witnesses someone else. Astaghfirullah. In a condition that is absolutely unacceptable. Displaying their behind in front of him. We're trying to read salah, my brother. Respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lift those jeans up a little bit higher. Don't be from among those who drop them half the way down. Because soon the trend will be no jeans at all. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Really. Don't just follow blindly the trends. Remember, the etiquette in Islam regarding dress is what will inshallah earn you paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us. So Allah says, tell them to dress with the outer garment. The first thing is to be able to dress appropriately. Secondly, It is an outer garment, more like a cloak that you're wearing on top of your clothing. Something that will be covering you, your shape, your size and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows why he has issued this instruction. Today, a lot of people are judged by the type of clothing they wear. So those who have 
tight fitting clothing showing their bodies and their bodies happen to be subhanallah you know like we've said before figures like triggers if that's the case and that's what people are judging them by wallahi we are degrading the women folk we are making them sex objects we are making them an object of male pleasure and that's it but if a female happens to wear a cloak as she leaves everyone else wearing the cloak the shape of the body is not shown you are not enslaved by the size or shape of your body then you are truly liberated my beloved sisters may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us liberation in the true sense what a beautiful injunction i hope and i pray that these few words can motivate us to dress appropriately these are the last few days of ramadan few days left let's make an intention that inshallah our dress code will change in sh for the right inshallah in the right direction for the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both female as well as male amin then we have Surah Yasin, a beautiful surah that a lot of us know of by heart. And Al-Hakim makes mention of a narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He says, Al-As ibn Wa'il, who was one of the leaders of Quraysh, who was a disbeliever. And there is another narration mentioned by At-Tabari, a narration of Qatada. He says it was Ubay ibn Khalaf. So let's say it was one of the two, either Ubay ibn Khalaf or Al-As ibn Wa'il. What did they do? They came with a powdered form of bones. You know when the bones are decomposed, when a person's died, and this person got hold of these remains, and it was like a powdered form, totally dis decomposed, disintegrated. And he came with it to Muhammad wasallam. He was not a believer. But he comes to Muhammad wasallam and he says, do you see what this is? These are bones. This is a human being, the remains of a human. They are in a powdered form here. Are you trying to claim that Allah, that you are worshipping, is going to give life to, the, to this powder that's here in my hands, and Allah is going to bring it back to, to life? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, Surah Yasin, verse number 77, 78. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةٌ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ The first part of the response where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Does man not see that he was created from a droplet of semen? He was created from one drop of sperm. And now that he's big and old, he wants to come and argue. Imagine if you think of your humble beginnings and mine. Where were we before we were born? There was a time when we were neither he, nor she, nor it, because we were not in existence besides how Allah knows. And then we were born. Today we are old and we think we're a big deal. And we want to argue and debate regarding Allah. And Allah says, I made you and you're going to come back to me, whether you like it or not. So stop arguing regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, think of your humble beginnings. You were a droplet, subhanallah. A little droplet and today you want to argue you're a big man you think you're a big deal may Allah forgive us so that's what Allah says in Surah Yasin that does man not see that we created him from a single droplet and now suddenly he wants to debate and argue then Allah says وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهُ قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ Mention is being made of this argument. Who is going to give life to these bones after they are decomposed and disintegrated completely? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ Say, he who brought it to life in the first place will give it life once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It's quite simple. In fact, we are taught in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when he created from nothing at the beginning, just with the word, what is the word? The word is bi, kun in the Arabic language. As we say, amruhu bayn al-kafi wa noon. The instruction of Allah is between a kaf and a noon. In the English language, we would say B and E. It makes B. So when Allah says B, it became without anything prior to that. From nothing Allah made, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, if I can make from nothing, then for me to reconstruct from something that's already existing is simple. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He grant us a deep understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in every single way. Amen. Then we have Surah Al-Zumar, a beautiful surah. And I want to mention a verse that was revealed in conjunction with another verse that we've spoken about a few days back. 
Also a hadith that happens to be muttafaq alayh of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. He says there were some people from among the mushrikeen who came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and said that we definitely believe that what you're saying is very good and what you're calling towards is really good. But you know, we have committed shirk, meaning we've associated partners with Allah. And we have committed adultery. And we have committed murder. And these sins, according to a verse that you've recited, are not forgivable. Meaning Allah is going to punish those who have engaged in these sins. Now, I want to pause for a moment. My brothers and sisters, we all know that Allah says He will not forgive association of partnership with Him. But when is the question? Only if a person dies without having sought forgiveness for shirk, will Allah not forgive them. But while you're alive, you can seek forgiveness from any sin you've committed and Allah will forgive you. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the bulk of them were mushrikeen before they entered the fold of Islam. But when they asked Allah's forgiveness and they turned their ways and habits and they came onto the straight path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. They became the best of the lot. These were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So never think for a moment that Allah does not forgive shirk when you have asked for forgiveness from that shirk. He will forgive it. The condition is you need to ask for forgiveness. The only time he will not forgive it is if a person has died in that condition and not repented from it. So anyway, when these people came to ask Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verses were revealed. Two sets of verses. The one was Surah Al-Furqan, verse number 68, and we read it the other day. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Allah makes an exception from the punishment of those who have sought forgiveness, who have believed and who have done good deeds. And he says, what we will do for them as a favor from us to show our mercy is that we will take their bad deeds and we will convert them into good deeds and place them on the right side of the scale for them to benefit from that on the day of judgment. That's the mercy of Allah. When imagine, and I thought of this the other day, if you owed someone 10,000 rands and you go to them with the 10,000, or you go to them and you say, look, I really apologize. I don't have the 10,000. And they tell you, it's okay. I forgive you. You will be excited, won't you? But what about what Allah has shown here? And obviously the example of Allah is far higher. But I'm giving you the example of a 10,000 rand just to bring it close to your mind. You go to the man and you say, listen, I don't have the 10,000. He says, you don't have it. Never mind. Take another 10. You can have this as well. That's the mercy of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even above that, higher than that. Allah says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, the person committed sin. They came back to me. They did not repeat that sin. They changed their whole life. For that, not only will I say, I forgive your sins, but I'm going to say, all the sins you committed, I want to convert them and make them good deeds. Now you can go. Subhanallah. This is the mercy of Allah. And another verse revealed on the same occasion was verse number 150 of Surah Al-Zumar, known as the, the verse filled with the most hope in the whole Quran. In the entire Quran, there is one verse that is filled with the most hope. What is it? Verse number 150 of Surah Al-Zumar. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh Muhammad sallam, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah, no matter what you've done. Allah says, I am most forgiving. I will forgive all the sins. Indeed, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. What greater mercy can we have? My brothers and sisters, imagine if Allah did not forgive our sins, we would be doomed. Perhaps a little while down the line, we would feel we are already going into Jahannam. What's the point of doing good deeds now? But Allah says, no, I will wipe out no matter what you've done in terms of evil. This is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uttered a beautiful statement, which really gives us goosebumps. And that is, At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kamalla dhambalah. One who has sought forgiveness from sin is equivalent to the one who never ever committed the sin. Subhanallah. You ask Allah's forgiveness, it's wiped out, it's gone. And this is why shaitan comes to us and makes us doubt Allah's mercy. Remember, 
do not suffer from this trap of shaitan. Don't be entrapped by him. You've committed a sin. You've asked Allah's forgiveness. That's it. It's gone and it's wiped out. Do not let shaitan come back to you and say, Hey, I don't think that sin was forgiven. Because what it does, it bogs you down. It makes you feel heavy. It makes you feel distant from Allah. Rather, feel close to Allah. Fight shaitan. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. May Allah protect us from the devil, the accursed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So this is a beautiful verse. My brothers and sisters, do you know these nights of Ramadan are so powerful? The end of Ramadan is such that we arrive at a climax right at the end. Amazingly, Allah has kept one night among these 10 nights that is better than a thousand months. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she, when she heard that it's important for us to look for Laylatul Qadr, look for Laylatul Qadr means try your best to engage in acts of worship so that you can achieve the mercy of Allah. So she asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you see if I were to find the night of Al Qadr, meaning the night of decree, what is the best thing I could do in terms of acts of worship? And a lot of us ask the same questions, right? He did not give a long list of things to say, do this and do this and 20 times and 50 times and 100 times and a thousand times and three times and five times and so on. And you've overshot and your suhoor is also lost. He did not give such a list. He says, Quli, Allahumma inna ka afuun tuhibbul afwa fafu anni. That's it. He says, say and repeat the statement, Oh Allah, you are most forgiving. You love to forgive, so forgive me. If you repeat that statement often, you will find if Allah has forgiven you, that's all you need. What more do you want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Forgiveness. So this is why, yes, it is correct to engage in dhikr. It is correct to have extra Quranic recitation, to perhaps engage in extra voluntary prayers. All that is correct. I'm not saying it's wrong. But remember, one of the most powerful things you could do is to sit and seek Allah's forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. This is why we say, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we have a totally different story in Surah Fussilat, where it is a hadith muttafaq alayh, reported by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh. He says, there were three people who gathered from among the mushrikeen of Quraysh. Two of them were from Quraysh and one of them was from, from Banu Thaqif. Or two of them were Thaqafis and one was a Qurashi from Quraysh. What's important is there were three of them. They were discussing amongst the, themselves. Big people, you know, quite fat, but they were quite thick as well. So the one says uh, to the other, do you think that this Allah that Muhammad Wasallam is calling towards, do you think Allah can actually hear us? So the others say, well, you know, I think if we whisper, maybe he can't hear. But if we speak loudly, maybe he can hear. And they had an argument and the other one said, well, if he can hear us speaking loudly, then I'm sure he can hear the whispers as well. And this debate happened between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses. Like I said, this hadith is muttafaqun alayh. Verse number 22 of Surah Fussilat. وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَتِرُونَ أَنْ يَشْهَدَ عَلَيْكُمْ سَمْعُكُمْ وَلَا أَبَصَارُكُمْ وَلَا جُنُودُكُمْ وَلَكِنْ ظَنَنْتُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَعْلَمُ كَثِيرًا مِمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ You were not covering yourselves from your ears, your eyes, and your skins, and yet you thinking that Allah cannot hear you. What Allah is saying is, Allah knows what you're doing. Not only Allah, your eyes will bear witness, your ears will bear witness, your skin will bear witness, and you are still thinking perhaps Allah didn't hear us. Your tongue, your mouth will also bear witness. And this is why another verse revealed on a similar occasion, verse number 80 of Surah Al-Zukhruf. Allah says, أَمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّا لَا نَسْمَعُ سِرَّهُمْ وَنَجْوَاهُمْ بَلَا وَرُسُلُنَا لَدَيْهِمْ يَكْتُبُونَ Do they think, do they think for a while that we are not listening to their whispers and to their secret statements? Do they think we're not listening? Allah says, indeed, our angels are right there recording everything that's happening. So the problem here, or should I say the matter is twofold. One is, these people are not only, and it it's for every single one of us, we not only have angels recording, but our own organs of the same body that we have right now, 
are also recording. They also will bear witness. And this is why Allah says in another verse in the Quran, يَوْمَ تَشْهَدُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ On that day, and this is in Surah An-Nur, where Allah says, Do you know what will bear witness against the people? Their hands will bear witness as to what they touched, or against them. Their legs will bear witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they don't even realize. Their tongues will bear witness that this is what we uttered. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in a way that our organs bear witness for us and not against us. Remember, you can never hide from Allah. The best option you have is to seek Allah's forgiveness because when you seek Allah's forgiveness, Allah makes your organs forget what you did. Allah makes all the items that bore witness forget what you did, including the angels that recorded what you did. It is wiped out and erased in a way that they themselves don't know what you did because tawbah wipes out whatever you've done in the past. Tajubbuma qablaha wipes out whatever was before it. So ask Allah's forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you and will forgive all of us. Then we have a beautiful verse also connected to sustenance. Everyone today is running behind money. Agree? Everyone wants money. And the, the, the thing that actually baffles us, the more money we have, the more we run behind it. Have you noticed that? You know, people who've just got five or ten rands, they're happy with another fifty rands, mashallah. Subhanallah. Do you understand what I'm saying here? But someone who's got five million, hundred rands means nothing to them. It's just not even loose change, it's by the way. They won't even look in that direction. It's got to be a figure for them to open their eyes once again. May Allah forgive us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us quite clearly in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ فَضَّلَ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ فِي الرِّزْقَ It is Allah who has favored some above the other. When it comes to sustenance, you can only fulfill your zakah if there are poor people. If there were no poor people, where would we be filling the zakah? Where would we be giving it to? So this is why Allah says, we have tested some with the others. Those who have, alhamdulillah, it must not make them arrogant. Those who do not have, it must not make them disbelieve. There is a hadith which says that perhaps sometimes poverty may lead to disbelief if the people don't have conviction in Allah, it will make them do something wrong in order to earn. When a person is desperate, some people give up morality in order to earn. Some people give up their faith in Allah in order to earn. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. So what happened is, and this is a narration made mention of by Al-Hakim, narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, a book known as Al-Mustadrak. And he says, some of the people known as Ashabu Suffa, who were Ashabu Suffa? They were some poor people in Medina Munawwara who had less, who were less privileged. They used to spend a lot of the time adjacent to the masjid in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala known as Masjid al-Nabawi. Today, if you were to visit Masjid al-Nabawi, there is a slightly raised platform. Somewhere near there, that is where they say these people used to sit. There were quite a few of them. Some take the number to 60, 70 and so on. Some actually raise it a bit more and some drop it slightly. But some of them were making a dua or they were looking at those with wealth and hoping that they too have wealth. Now, you know, when I make dua and you make dua, oh Allah, grant us sustenance. May Allah grant us sustenance. Amen. I notice an Ameen comes quite loudly when you say, May Allah give us money. May Allah give us, may Allah get us married. You know, that's one that I've always not understood. When you say, May Allah grant us good spouses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get us married. The married men are saying Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah open our doors. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really open our doors. My brothers and sisters, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all sustenance that comes with goodness. When you make dua for sustenance, you got to say, Oh Allah, grant me well so that I can use it in the right cause. You don't just say, Oh Allah, give me millions so I can buy an S-class, I can buy a house, a car, I can do this. Not only worldly items, no. It's got to be something to do with your link with Allah. Oh Allah, grant me wealth, I want to build a masjid. Oh Allah, grant me wealth, I want to look after the orphans. Oh Allah, grant me wealth, I'd like to spend in your cause. And then follow through, subhanallah. So some of these people were asking, Oh Allah, grant us wealth. And their, their reasoning was to do with worldly items. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verses, verse number 27 of Surah Al-Shura, 
ولو بسط الله الرزق لعباده لبغوا في الأرض ولكن ولكن ينزل بقدر ما يشاء If Allah had to extend provision for all his worshippers, perhaps they would be committing tyranny on earth. But he only sends down a fixed portion that he knows to whomsoever he wishes because he knows what each person should get and how much is better for them. If Allah has kept you a little bit lower, perhaps it's better for you. That doesn't mean you don't make dua and it does not mean you don't try. But you must understand what you get at the end, you must be happy with it. Alhamdulillah. Some people have qualifications, degrees upon degrees, PhD upon PhD, but they're sitting unemployed. And the other uncle, he hasn't even been through primary school and he's got one of the biggest businesses in South Africa. Do you know who I'm talking about? Well, I don't know either. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and grant us all these. It's just an example I gave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. I see people were getting really worried there. <laughs> Ask Allah goodness. My brothers and sisters, these are the days of dua. These are the days of goodness. These are the days of the of the blessed month of Ramadan. These are the last few days. This is when there is a climax. Lillahi utaqa. Every night Allah has people whom He frees from the fire of Jahannam. Oh Allah, free us from the fire of Jahannam. Ya Allah, this gathering that is seated here, those who may be listening across the oceans, Ya Allah, grant us all forgiveness. Ya Allah, grant us mercy on this eve. Ya Allah, help us. Every single one of us has so many difficulties and issues peculiar to us that we may be going through. You know better than us what we are struggling with. Ya Allah, help every single one of us. We ask you to bless us on this eve. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.